Welcome to the online video ministry of First Presbyterian Church in Perkesy, Pennsylvania. First Church is a ministry of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church located on the corner of Fifth and Race Streets. Our services begin at 9.30 on Sunday mornings. We would like to give a special welcome to the pastors and Christian workers from around the world who are joining us online. First Church is a member of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. If you would like to support this ministry, please do so with your prayers, fellowship, and offerings. May the Lord richly bless you through this video ministry. He restores my soul. 
He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Verse 53. 
When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore. When they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came, in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even <clears throat> the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. Next, a reading from the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 2. And we'll pick up with verse 11. Ephesians chapter 2. Paul writes about the work of Jesus and his calling together many into his flock. Therefore, remember that at one time you, Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. We'll finish our reading from God's Word here. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer, make use of the prayer that the Lord taught His disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
make our way through this confession together. We're looking at the seventh article in that confession, and we began that article last week, and I'll pick up our reading uh, from where we left off in our consideration from last week. So it's a little bit of an extended uh, article to consider. The topic is the sufficiency of scripture. And we'll continue reading as follows. Since it is forbidden to add to or take away anything from the word of God, Deuteronomy 12, 22, it is evident that the doctrine thereof is most perfect and complete in all respects. We may not consider any writings of men, however holy these men may have been, of equal value with the divine scriptures. Nor ought we to consider custom, or the great multitude, or antiquity, or succession of times and persons, or councils, decrees, or statutes, as of equal value with the truth of God, since the truth is above all. For all men are of themselves liars, and lighter than of wrath. Psalm 62, verse 9. We therefore reject with all our heart whatever does not agree with this infallible rule. As the apostles have taught us, test the spirits to see whether they are of God. 1 John 4, verse 1. Likewise, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, or give him any greeting. Since the scriptures come to us as God's word, they are the revealed word of God in verbal form. We can trust what they have to say. And God himself, being the author of scripture, defines what is the scripture. It is what he speaks. And so, of necessity, there is a limit to our understanding of the canon of Scripture. It is that which God has spoken. And we are not to add to that which God has spoken anything that any other man might speak on his own. So there is a great distinction to be made between that which God has revealed infallibly and inherently in His Word and that which men might wish to add to that. You recall that the scriptures do provide uh, warnings against adding to the word of God or taking away from that word. Now, we need to understand what these warnings entail. They certainly warn us against uh, additional visions or revelations of the mind or spirit or something like that, as though God is telling me to do this or that or the other thing, uh, or there's a, some other way of worshiping God besides that which is given in scripture. We are confined to what Scripture has to say and not to be carried about by these additions. There, many of the cults have additional Scriptures added to them. In fact, the, the Roman Church adds tradition along with Scripture. And you'll see from what uh, Pastor DeBray says here that he will enter into a bit of an apologetic against the Roman Catholic Church that made an appeal to tradition to the various scholars of the church and the teachings of the church over time and an oral tradition that they claimed uh, continued on in the church, which was also a revelation from God. Uh, the reformers taught that the scriptures themselves are the word of God. In our modern day, there are some who advocate for a particular translation of the Bible, the King James Version, as inspired and errant word of God, a new revelation of God in modern translations which have some differences in the readings, are claimed to be uh, those which take away from the Word of God or add to the Word of God, however it might be. In my understanding of these matters, it seems to me that our modern translations of God have gotten us closer to the original text of Scripture, and indeed they bring that text uh, into the modern tongue, which is the purpose of God's Word uh, that it be translated in ways that people today can understand most fully. That being said, let us suppose that what the, the King James only people assert were, were true, that by an addition to the scripture, by one word, by an addition of word, a subtraction of a word, that therefore you are breaking this commandment. 
Well, what happens when your child learns to memorize scripture and misquotes a text of scripture? Has he violated these commands against adding or subtracting to the word of God? Does he come under judgment for such a thing? If your pastor stands before you and misquotes a text of scripture, does he come under judgment of God for such a thing? Clearly not. We should quote scripture accurately and faithfully, obviously. Uh, but to suggest that any kind of variation in that respect it, it comes under these uh, judgments, I think, is uh, overwrought and hyperventilated. It seems to me that the judgments are against those who would add to the revelation other words of revelation or subtract from what God has to say and say, whereas God says that Christ came to be an atonement for our sin in this offering, well, there are some today who take that away from the church and say, well, that really wasn't his purpose. He simply came to provide a moral example. We see there you're taken away from the teaching of God's word. You're subtracting from it. Or some would say that the Old Testament is given to uh, Israel long ago. It does not apply to the church today. And so the law of Moses just simply applied to that old covenant people of time, but doesn't apply to the church today. Well, that's taken away effectively from the word of God. And I'm not going to say that that brings us under the judgments described here, but we need to be very careful that we listen to the whole word of God and not go and pick and choose what we like to hear. I was reading a quote by St. Augustine this week where he said that if you only accept those portions of the Gospels or the Bible that you like and disregard the rest, then you're not truly believing the Gospel, you're simply believing in your own heart. You're simply following your own heart. You're not following God's word. God's word comes to us and speaks with fullness and clarity. And we need to listen to that whole text of scripture and abide by it. So we don't consider the writings of any men, however holy they may have been, of equal value to the divine scriptures. I love studying theology. I enjoy reading the great theologians of the church from the very ancient writers uh, I've enjoyed reading the, the Psalms of Chrysostom, one who was considered the golden tongue of order of his day. Uh, through St. Augustine, his confessions are wonderful reading uh, on to the various theologians of the church through the centuries. I benefit from them immensely. I am challenged. My thinking is strengthened by all these things. However noble, pure, and good many of these writers are, they do not compare to Scripture. And their only value is in helping me to understand Scripture. And where they depart from Scripture, which they are fallible, then we, we need to depart from them at that point. We need to follow Scripture itself. So we don't follow particular men, theologians. We don't follow councils, decrees, or statutes necessarily. We follow the Christ who speaks in his holy word. Now, there's a place for councils, decrees, statutes, all these kinds of things. But they are not of equal value with the scriptures. And so, the brief concludes by noting how frail and uh, weak and even sinful uh, people are. And therefore, we need to commit ourselves entirely to what God's word has to say. We are reminded in Scripture to test the spirit to see whether they are of God. There are many false spirits at work in the world today, leading many people astray. When you go into various churches across our country, there are false spirits in their midst. Those who preach a false gospel do not preach the Christ of Scripture. And we need to test the spirits, compare them with what Scripture says. Similarly, when uh, somebody comes knocking on your door, like the Jehovah's Witness often do, and they want to talk to you about their vision of the future, uh, talk to them about Jesus and how they need to repent of their view of Jesus. They don't, as I've mentioned before, they don't have a way of getting to that paradise that they want to talk to you about because the Jesus that they affirm is not the Christ of Scripture. The Jesus that they affirm is merely a creature, a finite creature created creature, and a finite created creature cannot provide for you an infinite atoning sacrifice for your sins against an infinite holy God. 
You need the Christ of Scripture, and only He can save you from your sins. Well, we'll finish our meditation there from the Belgian Confession and sing our hymn of the month, number 492. Take my life and let it be. Hymn number 492. Where are you staying? 
He said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and follow Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, So you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can any good come out of can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the work of your spirit who opens our hearts to receive the things that are given here. We pray that you would bless this meditation on your word this morning, that we would be equipped to follow you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Follow me. That's a rather um, old thing to say today. Anyone who thinks about their own life and think, well, there are ways and reasons why you shouldn't be following me. You should be following others, perhaps. But Jesus called his disciples to follow after him. It's a testimony to his purity, to his righteousness, to his glory, to his character. And so he began to call his disciples to follow after him. I've had an amazing experience this week in having over 200, now probably 300 different pastors from around the world contact me this week to become my friends on Facebook. And so I'm looking this, at this as an opportunity in the Lord's providence to share with them the ministry of God's Word and to instruct them and teach them from the Scriptures so that pastors who are in a wide variety of places, India, Pakistan, Liberia, uh, Kenya, Uganda, uh, Malaysia, Malawi, all kinds of places. So we have a great opportunity to share with them something of who Jesus is and what he's come to do. Follow me, well, follow Jesus. We've noted that the Gospel of John begins with this idea of a new creation. It is a new creation week in which we are exploring here. At the beginning of the Gospel, Jesus is the Word that was with God and was God. He was there at the beginning of creation and all things were made by Him. Then we saw that John begins to develop this first new creation week. So using the echoes of the old creation, the, the formation of the heavens and the earth long ago in six days, now, and resting on the seventh, now he takes this new work of God. 
uh, recognizing the new powers of the age to come that have entered into the world, this new creation which Jesus is bringing about. And John begins his gospel with the first week. Interestingly, he's going to end his gospel with the last week of Jesus' life on earth as well. So you have kind of two weeks providing an envelope for the gospel of John and reflecting on Jesus as he gathers his disciples and then as he suffers on their behalf. We've seen the first three days of the week uh, in, in previous sermons where uh, John uh, identified, answers questions from various in, interlocutors, uh, from the Pharisees and the, the scribes, the Jews as John describes them. And then uh, he, he points his disciples to the Lamb of God. It says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So on the third day, he's pointing his disciples to this Jesus, one of whom he says that I saw the Spirit descend upon him like a dove and settle upon him. Now that also is creation imagery, is it not? Remember, with the creation account, uh, you have the Spirit of the Lord hovering over the surface of the waters. Uh, participating in, in the refining work of creation. And now Jesus is one on whom the Spirit of God descends and settles upon Him. You can almost see the, the imagery of Noah's flood and when Noah sent out the ravens and the ravens went off and came back and he, he sent out the dove. The dove came back with a, a, a little bit of a, an olive branch signifying that the waters had settled. It was time for a new creation, a new order. Jesus is the one who receives the Spirit of God as a dove and conducts his ministry in the power, the recreating power of the Spirit. Now we're going to see this creation theme developing further now as we look at days four and five of this creation week where Jesus gathers his disciples. So we said we were going to look at first the witness of John the Baptist in days one through uh, three, and then his gap, the, the witness of the disciples in days four and five. Uh, day six is silent, and I speculated, and that's all it is, just speculation, that perhaps that was the Sabbath day and they were resting that particular day. Nothing particularly occurred that day, but anyway, on the seventh day, or as John describes it in John 2, verse 1, the third day following the fifth day, which gets you into Jewish ways of counting. Uh, any rate, that's when you have the wedding of Cain and Galilee. Galilee, we'll, we'll look at that later. But here Jesus is gathering his disciples, and the disciples give their witness to Jesus. So John bears witness. This is the Lamb of God. He, come, he sees his two disciples, uh, Andrew, and one who is not named. And more than likely, the one who is not named is the gospel writer himself, the apostle John. And you'll find as you go through the gospel accounts that there's a disciple who's always around in different places, but is never particularly named until the very end of the gospel where uh, Peter turns and sees John following him and says, what, what about this one? What shall we say? To, what will become of him? So, here, I think we have John, the, the author of the gospel, and Andrew. And as you look at the, the testimony here, you have various touches which indicate you have an eyewitness testimony here. Because details, specific details are added which give the flavor of one who is actually there. There is a measure of excitement at meeting Jesus. And then the, the fact that they, they, they were approaching the tenth hour of the day, that there's a certain specificity there. Uh, that indicates an eyewitness there. Uh, so, more than likely, John himself is one of those first disciples of Jesus uh, that gives us this account. But as is his habit, he doesn't call attention to himself. He points it elsewhere. And here, on, on this fourth day, he, he brings his, our attention to Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, and it's kind of an interesting description of Andrew because everybody knows who Simon Peter was. Not everybody knew about his brother, Andrew. Andrew would forever be known as the brother of Simon Peter. 
And Andrew seemed to be content with that. In the, in the course of the gospel accounts, we, we meet him a couple of other times, and he's always one who's kind of in the background and always bring people to Jesus. Uh, he, he brings Simon, uh, his brother, to Jesus here. Uh, there will be a time when the Gentiles will come to Andrew and Philip, who have Greek-sounding names, and they will ask him if they can see Jesus, and Andrew and Philip bring these men or, or talk to Jesus about whether they can see him or not. And so Andrew was one who uh, was self-effacing, was more interested in bringing people to Jesus, and he wasn't concerned about finding a place for himself. What a great testimony Andrew is to us. Uh, we don't all have the stellar capacities of a Simon Peter. We may labor in, in obscure ways, but God is pleased to bless our witness as we say, why don't you come with me and meet Jesus? Meet this one that I've met. And really, that's the, the simplicity of his message. Come and see. He comes to Peter and says, we have found the Christ. And he's excited about that. Come and see. And so Peter can point this out for himself. Andrew doesn't engage in long arguments. He doesn't develop philosophical schemes. He just says, come and see Jesus. Meet him for yourself. Decide for yourself. In the end, that's what we need to do. When you're witnessing to somebody and you're to speak to them. They might be arguing Plato and Aristotle. They might be arguing Immanuel Kant. They might be arguing all kinds of things. Uh, Charles Darwin and evolution, all these kinds of things. Put all that aside and just say, I may not have all the answers for all these things, but I'll ask you this. Simply come, open the scriptures, and meet Jesus. Let him show himself to you. And he will answer all of your questions. In one way or another, your questions will be answered. All of your objections will be answered. Ultimately, that's what we need to be doing. So Andrew was this wonderful person who, John says, first went to get his brother. You know, God often works through our family connections, doesn't he? You come to faith in Christ, and then you are eager to share that with family members, with parents, with brothers, sisters, children, what have you. And they see your life. They see a tremendous change in your life. Once you took care to go to church, now you, you want to be there every Sunday. What's up with that? What has brought this kind of a change about in you? And now you talk about praying, and you, you want to give Christ the glory for different things. What's that about? Well, God has changed you. And that brings a witness to those who are around you. And you should be eager, I'm sure you are, to see your loved ones come to meet Jesus as well. Here's the best thing to say to them. Come and see. Come and see. See for yourself. Now, it's interesting that the Baptist, John the Baptist, points to Jesus as the disciples are around him and says, Behold, the Lamb of God. So he's carrying on his witness from the previous day and saying, this is still him. This is the Lamb of God. And the, the Greek here says that when John looked at Jesus, he looked at him with a settled gaze. Look at this one. This is the Lamb of God. And there must have been something amazing to see, to, to think about that. All the prophecies of the Old Covenant. Moses saying a prophet will come after me. Uh, all the prophecies of the shepherd who would come. There he is. This is the one. This is the one whom God has provided to take away our sin and to save us. What an amazing thing. And John the Baptist similarly was that sort of self-effacing man where he said, look to Jesus. Don't look at me. Look to him. And he encouraged his disciples to leave John and go after Jesus. You know, as a pastor of a church, I don't, I'm not always eager to see my people go off elsewhere to other churches. I want them to stay. But John said, you need to go to Jesus and follow after him. 
That's my whole mission, to have you follow you after Him. And then, so John has that several gaze on Jesus. John, the Apostle John, and Andrew, as they're following Jesus, Jesus turns around and looks at them and says, what are you doing? Why are you following me? I think today we find somebody following us, we get a little bit nervous about that. <laughs> he asks them, what, what are you seeking? And, and they're probably a little bit bashful, you know, sit, standing some distance behind him, and, and not quite sure what to say. And it's like a lot of times when Peter just asks them, he says something, blurts it out, not quite thinking what he should be saying, like when he's up on that, uh, the Mount of Transfiguration and says, Lord, let's build three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He didn't know what he was talking about. I just had to say something at the moment. So the disciples here said, well, where are you staying? Actually, they had a purpose behind it. They wanted to sit down and talk to Jesus, get acquainted with him, meet him as the Lamb of God. And what does this mean? Who are you? What can we say about you? And so it was the 10th hour of the day. There's some dispute as to what exactly the time of the day it was. I, I suspect it was 4 in the afternoon. The day was coming towards a close. They needed to find a place to stay uh, for the night. Jesus said, my place is right over here. And incidentally, Jesus, who uh, tabernacled among us in his flesh, John emphasizes the fact that he was a real man. And he had a place to stay. Elsewhere in the Gospels, he will, he will say that the birds of the air have nests and foxes have holes, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So in his ministry, traveling about would involve him sleeping out at night. But here he had a place to stay. And I, I, again, I think John is calling our attention to this to emphasize the fact that he, of his humanity. He rested. And so in, in, in his theological circles, as people were being swept up with the ideas of Gnosticism and the separation between the spirit and flesh, an idea that Jesus really didn't come in the flesh, he was just a spirit, John says, hey, we saw him. We saw the place where he stayed. We stayed with him overnight. We talked with him in his house. And so you can hear the echo of the way that he opens his first epistle that which we have seen, that which our eyes have beheld and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. This we proclaim to you. John's saying, I saw him. I saw him sit down. I saw him fall asleep. This was a real man. No mere ghost or spirit. Or no, certainly no figment of my imagination. And so they had an opportunity to talk to him. And now, because of that, the next day, Andrew goes out and, and seeks, or excuse me, later he, he finds Simon, his, his brother, and says, we found the Messiah. There's a, an excitement there in his voice. <coughs> we found the Messiah. What a tremendous thing. He could speak that with confidence. Simon comes over to, to meet with Jesus, and what does Jesus do? He says to him, says, I, I see you are Simon, son of John. He knows the character of Simon already. He says to him, you will be named Cephas, which is Aramaic for rock. The Greek word would be Peter. And he would repeat that again in Matthew 16. You are Petros, the rock. And on this rock, I will build my church. Peter, who we are familiar with as being one who is impulsive, uh, quick to speak, not always thinking through what he has to say, uh, Peter is one whom Christ, by his work of regeneration and the, the uh, sanctifying work of the Spirit, will make him into a rock for the church. His confession of faith will be a foundation for the church. And we see here the great power of Jesus Christ to transform a life from one who is uh, scattered about and is thinking and impulsive and, and running about, doing all kinds of things, to a solid rock on which the church might gather around. Do you find
find that you are rather impulsive, unsteady, uncertain about things, running about, not sure what to think or what to say in different situations, come to Jesus. He can transform you and make you a rock of the faith. Make you strong in the Lord. So that people will see a tremendous witness to Christ in you. Christ changes people to where they're at to where he will make them to be. And Christ always looks at us, not so much at where we're at right now, but where he's going to bring us in the future. He will transform us in a powerful way. So, Jesus names Peter, it, again, is a creation kind of echo here, like Adam naming the animals and giving to them their identity. Jesus names his disciples and identifies them by his sovereign word. When you name somebody, you're claiming ownership of them and you're defining their nature, their character. Jesus named Simon Cephas the Rock. Now, Got to go quickly here. Philip, <laughs> Philip uh, is a different character. He, he is one whom Jesus has to go out and find. Andrew and John were following Jesus along the way. John had pointed them out to them, and, and, and they too follow after Jesus. But now Jesus looks after Philip. And as we get to know Philip in the Gospel accounts, he's one who as one commentator said, it's not always up to, to par with things. He doesn't quite always know what to do. He seems to be out of his element many times. Uh, and, and so he's more of a retiring type of person, not the outgoing, aggressive type of personality, the type of personality is going out to change things. He's a more reclining person. Um, and, and so you have a, a, a number of uh, examples of him uh, like when Jesus fed the 5,000, uh, Jesus asked them how much bread, how much bread do we need to feed these? And Philip says, well, uh, what, was, what was his answer? So many days wages would be necessary to feed all of these and even that would not be enough. He tries to calculate the whole thing, he can't figure it out. And then when he uh, is asked by some Greeks to, if they can see Jesus, he first goes to Andrew and says, what do we do? <laughs> and Andrew says, let's go to Jesus. Philip is not, Somebody who, who's, a, a, if you will, a dynamic individual. Uh, and Jesus has to go out and find him, Philip. He seeks him out. Here's the good shepherd finding his own. And we're reminded of the sovereign grace of Jesus. How he comes to his own and he seeks them out. And he powerfully calls them to follow him. wonderful it is that we have a Savior who comes to us individually at different points in our life and says, you, you, you follow me. And it's a powerful call that we cannot resist. We must follow him. We want to follow him. And so Philip comes, and the first thing that Philip wants to do is find his friend, Nathaniel. Now, Nathaniel this is the only time we get to uh, meet Nathaniel, at least by this name. The rest of the gospel accounts, this, what we call the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, have a fellow by the name of Bartholomew, which is a, a kind of a last name, a patronymic name, uh, not a first name, a typical name, but his name in the, the synoptic gospels as Bartholomew, and he's always listed with Philip. They go hand in hand. Remember, then in the Gospels, as Jesus calls his disciples, he calls them two by two. James and John, Peter and Andrew, Philip and Bartholomew, and, and so forth. And, and, and it's more than likely that Nathaniel here in John 1 is the Bartholomew in the other Gospel accounts. In any case, Nathaniel uh, has Philip come and approach him, and, and Philip says, come, we found the Messiah. Same kind of excitement. This is amazing. We found the Messiah. He's arrived. He's the one of whom Moses in the law and the prophets spoke. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, 
He didn't know everything there was to know about Jesus, did he? Jesus was from Nazareth, but his birthplace was in Bethlehem. Jesus' adopted father was Joseph. His true father was God. He was virgin born. Philip's understanding of who Jesus was needed to, to grow. But what he said was true. I would reflect on what I read earlier from John Calvin, where he really gets on Philip's case for not knowing these details about Jesus, and as though he was misrepresenting Jesus. I don't think he was misrepresenting. He was just simply saying what he knew, and what he knew was true. Jesus was from Nazareth, and he was the son of Joseph, legally. So that was sufficient for Nathaniel to come and to see Jesus. Now, Nathaniel raises an objection, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Now, some attribute that to cross-town rivalries uh, or uh, the idea that Nazareth was a, a place of, like a den of thieves in a very bad neighborhood and you wanted to avoid Nazareth at all costs. There may be something to that, but... Uh, it's possible, too, that Nathaniel was saying, can the Messiah really come out of Nazareth? Can the, the good one come from Nazareth? Remember, that was a great question among the Pharisees. He's from Nazareth. How could he be the Christ? Look at the scriptures. You don't find that the Christ comes from Nazareth, do you? So Nathaniel raises his questions, and Philip doesn't know quite how to answer them. And he says, well, just come and see. And so Philip takes him up on, or Nathaniel takes him up on that, approaches Jesus, and, and of course Jesus sees him coming, and uh, he says, "Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile or deceit." And that description takes us back to the story of Jacob and Joseph, and how, um, excuse me, Jacob and Esau, and how Jacob deceived his father Isaac to take the birthright, and. Uh, he was named kind of a supplanter. And so Jesus, looking upon Nathaniel, says, this is a true Israelite in whom there is no denial. He's indicating that here's one who does not have that fallen sinful nature of Israel long ago, but he's one who's been redeemed, who's been changed. And indeed, as Calvin does positively say, this is a testimony to the fact that Nathaniel was a little bit unusual in Israel. There were many Israelites who were not true Israelites. In other words, they were descendants of Abraham well enough, but they did not have the faith of Abraham. Nathaniel had that true faith. And Nathaniel says to him, well, how do you know me? I mean, this is the first time we've met. How do you know that I'm a true Israelite and whom there is no God? How do you, how do you know my character? Rather than just simply saying, yes, that's right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, he says, how do you know this? And Jesus says, before uh, you, you came, I saw you under the fig tree. Now, first, that indicates that Jesus is omniscient. He could see him before he actually met him. He knew him perfectly already. But it's quite possible that Nathaniel, under that fig tree, um, was having devotions, was reflecting upon his relationship with God. Perhaps uh, God was speaking to him in a special way at that time. And when Jesus said, uh, I saw you under the fig tree, that just had powerful repercussions for Nathaniel. Only the Messiah would know that. Only the Messiah would know, not only that I was under the fig tree, but that something happened there. And maybe that he came to know the Lord at that moment. He called out for salvation and was rescued. And now Jesus says, I saw you under that fig tree. You are a true Israelite in whom there is no God. And with this, Nathaniel responds as he only could. You are the Son of God. You are the king of Israel. The whole purpose of the Gospel of John is to point us to Jesus. 
These things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that by believing you might have life in His name. And Nathaniel gives us great testimony. This one is the Christ. And Jesus turns to him and says, because of this little thing, because I, I, I said that I saw you under the fig tree, that you believed, you'll see greater things than this. You will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And it's another image out of Israel's history of Jacob. It's out at night. He uh, falls asleep and he ha puts a, a stone under his head as a pillow. And during the course of the night, he has this vision, this dream of a ladder reaching up into the heavens. And the angels of God ascending and descending on that ladder. And Jesus effectively says, I am the fulfillment of Jacob's dream. I am Jacob's ladder. I am the one through whom the blessings of God come upon the earth. I am the one through whom your prayers and petitions ascend into the heavens. I am the Christ. I am the mediator. I am the one who reconciles heaven and earth. And if you wish to enjoy the blessings of God in this fellowship, come to me. Jesus is Jacob's ladder. He is the one through whom we receive all the blessings of heaven on earth. And so if we take a moment to come and see Jesus, surely no one ever has spoken like this. Who says that I am the one through whom all the blessings of God come, that I am the one who reconciles heaven and earth? Who says that? Who calls people powerfully and says, follow me? And then says to Simon, you will be called Cephas and transforms his nature. Who is it that identifies Nathaniel under the fig tree in advance of even meeting him? And then knows exactly what took place under that fig tree. Who knows these things? It's Jesus, the Son of God. He describes himself as the Son of Man. The God Man. The one who is, with that title, the figure in Daniel's vision in chapter 7, the Son of Man who appeared before the Ancient of Days and to whom all the kingdoms of this world were given. And he has authority over them all. He is the Son of Man. When he says that he is the Son of Man, he's not taking some lowly, uh, figure of speech as it were to say I'm just a guy, you know, no, pay no attention to me. I am this Christ. I am one promised to him. Will you follow this Jesus? Come and see. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the work of Christ in gathering his disciples. We thank you for the way in which you work through families and through friendships, and we pray that as we consider that, that you grant us grace to be enthralled with our view of Christ as the Lamb of God, and may we be uh, encouraged to call our friends and loved ones to Jesus, that they too might, in, might know him and be saved. We thank you for our time together this morning. We pray that your spirit would bless your word to your glory and praise. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
uh, seeking to train ministers. Pray that you would bless them and strengthen your work. Those who care for children, orphans, we pray, Lord, that you would uh, bless and strengthen them. We pray that you would feed and clothe your people, O oh Lord, and protect them from harm and from evil. And we think of those who are in Pakistan and, and India and places in Africa, Nigeria in particular, uh, where there's considerable hostility towards your people. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would defend them, protect your people, and overthrow the wicked, we pray. We pray that you would crush the opposition. We pray for uh, Pastor Andrew Brunson in Turkey. We pray, the Lord, for his release. We pray that he immediately be set free. We pray that the government of Turkey would uh, be rebuked. And Lord, we just pray that you would return him to his family and to his ministry. And preserve his health and strength, we pray. We thank you for your goodness and kindness to us and ask that you watch over us as we go into this new week. Bless us with your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. Amen.